Welcome to CSIS. Uh, it's great to have you all here, and we have um, an audience. Ah, there's the clicker. We have an audience uh, uh, watching uh, by streamed. Um, we don't know how many are there, but uh, we, we uh, usually quite a crowd. Um, my name is Michael Matera. I'm the director of the Americas program here at CSIS. Um, it's it's a, a great honor to have our panel here today, um, three extremely well-qualified economists from Argentina to talk about Argentina. Um, these last six months in Argentina have been a real test of the country's commitment to reform and to the profound change in culture that President Macri is, is leading. With strong support from the international community, especially from the United States, Argentina received this summer a large standby arrangement from the IMF that has helped the country to maintain its commitment to reform. Just last week, the IMF board approved the first review of the $57 billion standby agreement following the approval last Wednesday by Argentina's lower house of Congress of a zero primary deficit federal budget uh, for 2019. Since the beginning of the year, the country has experienced a sharp depreciation of the currency with inflation um, over 40% at this point. The year ahead is an electoral year with the country facing presidential elections in late October. Given global economic conditions um, and uh, its own tight budget, high inflation, and an expected economic contraction this year, the country faces uh, a complicated year ahead. To provide us with some perspective on the developments of the last nine months, uh, we have for you this morning a panel of three Argentine economists who will help, uh, will try to help us sort out these complicated months since the beginning of the year and to assess the prospects ahead in 2019. Our focus is going to be primarily on the economics of the current reality, but it's always difficult to keep politics out of the picture. Um, our three economists all are graduates of the University of Buenos Aires in economics. Uh, first, Sebastian Galliani, uh, who is now a professor of economics at the University of Maryland. He has his PhD from Oxford in economics. Um, most recently, he was vice minister of the treasury in Argentina uh, from the beginning of 2017 until this past summer, 2018. Um, he is, uh, has been a development advisor uh, for the bank, for the World Bank, for the IDB, uh, for the UN. He's a specialist in development economics. Um, and he uh, will be sharing with us some of his own personal experience uh, in working uh, in, in the government. Uh, Emilio Campo is an independent economist and an historian in Buenos Aires, a uh, professor of finance at University of USEMA. Uh, he has 20 years of experience in, in international finance with Morgan Stanley, Citibank, Chase Manhattan, among others. He's written seven books on economics, finance, and on history. Um, he, for me, is the leading specialist in Argentina on the issue of populism. Uh, we had him here about a year and a half ago um, uh, talking about that specific issue. He has uh, his master's, his MBA from the University of Chicago. And lastly, Silvina Vatnik. Um, Silvina uh, also uh, was in the Argentine government back in 2000, 2001, 2002. She was a senior advisor to the Secretary of Finance um, and also to the president of the Central Bank. She's now uh, working as a uh, partner in the consulting firm Global Outcomes. She's also a financial stability advisor to the US Treasury in countries including Guatemala. And she and Emilio are both CSIS senior associates. Uh, she has her uh, master's in economics from USEMA and a PhD in economics from Colombia. So without further ado, I'd like to turn the floor over to, to Sebastian, um, who will be followed by Emilio and then Sabrina. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, let me get straight to business. So uh, Argentina is a very complex country. In the, problem, the main problem it has is that it has a tradition of populist policies associated to Peronist governments. And every time, they, with the exception of President Menem, they get more or less the same policies. You can you can go back in history. For example, I was quoting Frigerio uh, when he was in charge of uh, fixing the economy in 1958. That was even three years after the fall of uh, Perón, and he still was facing with all the distortions of the Peronist 
policies. And typical, these distortions are uh, an isolation from trade, distorting all the prices in the economy, the exchange rate highly appreciated, all the public utility prices under uh, value, so below cost, and large fiscal deficit. So a typical, uh, how do I move here? Uh, here. A typical situation was the, or, or very similar situation to which President Macri inherits was the situation in 1975, where there was a huge uh, adjustment program uh, done by this uh, minister, Celestino Rodrigo, that again has all the prices of public utilities distorted uh, after price controls. Uh, he has to devaluate the currency 200%, and he has a very large fiscal deficit of 14%, right? So that's the typical situation. And, and he, he reflects that always the guy that has to fix these issues is not very popular, right? Because you are the person that has to make all these adjustments. So what Macri inherited was not different. He inherited well measured a deficit consolidated nation provinces, and I, I tell you why that's the way to think, to look at that. It's because just a few days before Macri took office, the Supreme Court ordered the executive to give back to the provinces a large fraction of the tax revenues which is about two points of GDP. So, if, so then you cannot compare uh, the, the deficit of the national government before and after Macri took over without making this adjustment. And the thing that was Macri cut a deal with the provinces where he was going to give the, this money back in five years, 20% every year, so we need to look over the years to the consolidated deficit. Otherwise, we don't observe all the fiscal efforts done by the Macri administration. So the situation was that when you, t you look at the uh, national, uh, and, the go and, and also the Kirchner administration was in default, so they were not paying interest, so you have to adjust the deficit to make it comparable for that, and also for the other things that changed between 1915 and, and 1916, one of which is the fact that the Kirchner administration store, uh, stopped uh, paying uh, in October 1915, so because the deficit is measured in base, based on payments, that also distorts the comparison. But when you make all this adjustment, the deficit that Macri inherited was about eight points. So let's say it's 8.5 percent, which is, uh, I'm, I'm finishing a document on, on the exact number, but it's going to be close to that. Okay, so that's a very large deficit, and, and the, the situation is that not, not only you have that deficit, the inflation was very high. The, in 1915, inflation was 27%, but, but the core inflation was 30, was 30. And, and so why was the total inflation lower? Because, the, as I say, the previous administration was not adjusting public utilities, so public utilities only increased 10% that year. So it was distorted over the years, but that years as well. So what Macri faced was the situation that he has to decrease inflation, he has to decrease the deficit, but also public expenditure exploded during the uh, Kirchner administration. It's like they created a second state. So public expenditures in Argentina were about 25% before the 2002 crisis. So that's nation, provinces, and municipalities. And you see it went to almost 42%. Uh, at 2015, right? And, and so after Macri took over, it started to decrease, and our plan when I was in government that we set up was to, re to reduce public expenditures uh, to 32 points of GDP by uh, the end of the second terms of Macri administration, and that's going to be a huge adjustment of uh, 10 points of GDP. 
That's never happened in Argentina, and I challenge people to find many countries that did such adjustment uh, in the short run. So it will be comparable to what Israel did uh, over more than a decade, when gradually, by growing more than increasing public expenditures, they decreased public expenditure from 55% to 40 okay? Still very high compared to, to Argentina, but that's the type of things that we had in mind when we set up our, our policy. One important thing that, that you need to understand is where public expenditure increased, because if you want to get back, it's important to know where it really increased. And it mostly increased in three areas. It increased in subsidies, five points of GDP. That's huge. That's all the price distortions that I was mentioned. And that's the, where you can act more effectively, by increasing prices of gas, oil, electricity, water, etc., transport, transport, public transport, above inflation, right? you are starting to reduce those subsidies. But when you start with an inflation of 30, increasing those prices above inflation, it really is a boost to inflation and to inflation expectations that make hard to decrease inflation. In, in any event, part of the discussion was whether Macri could have done a much faster reduction in deficits by going faster in the decrease of those subsidies. And I think that's really, obviously, it's a counterfactual discussion, but if you think that's taking the money from the private sector, taking two or three points of GDP in a year from the private sector, it's going to lead to an important recession. So the idea of the government was to do it gradually, like every year is, in, is reducing these subsidies in 0 0.6, 0 0.7 of GDP, which is still taking that money from the households, but is something that the government's done in these three years, every year, and will do it next year as well. The other five points were in social security, and that's mostly uh, pensions that were given to citizens that did not contribute to social security. So the previous government gave almost four million pensions. Now, you can't take back those pensions. even. So first, it's not you can you can do it without a law. But even if you pass a law, which the government doesn't have majority, and, and also the government is not trying to do it. But let me put myself out of the government thinking that you, you try to put that law, it's going to be declaring inconstitutional by by the judicial system immediately, and that's not possible. So I'm going to tell you how we move to Ashas the social security, because the government did a lot uh, to adjust social security, although it's not much recognized in, in, in the country discussions, in part because the government perhaps didn't explain it well, how the, the reforms that uh, we did work. And finally, there's a huge increase in salaries that's public employees. And the problem with that is, is highly concentrated in the provinces and municipalities. And, and, but, and the, the, I'm saying the problem for two reasons. First, because given the devolution of tax receipts to the provinces, they don't have deficits. So they are not under pressure to do much reform in that form. And uh, second, because the government cannot mandate. One, one thing that I try to to enact when I was there was a program, massive program of voluntary retirement in the province, but provinces were not interested in that, in that program. So what we did was a fiscal responsibility law that f basically says provinces cannot increase expenditures about inflation, and then if the economy grows, that will contribute to reduce what they spend uh, in total, but in particular in, in salaries. Um, okay. Given say that, let me, well, that you see what is what we were expecting, having an economy growing 3.5% per year, 
right? And achieving the every year the uh, fiscal responsibility law. So assuming that no one increased expenditures about inflation and the economy grow 3.5, which is not that high given that population grows at one, so that's a per capita 2.5%. The public expenditures will go down to 32%. The, that will be, in, with, let's say, at that point, three points of interest, that will have been a total expenditure of 35 And that will be consistent with fin financial equilibrium, given that we, uh, Macri took over with a tax pressure of 31 uh, 32 so we expected to decrease it to 28, and then the government collect non-tax revenues for six points of GDP. That's, that's basically going to lead to the 35 points of revenue that's going to match expenditures. And so that was basically the plan to restore macroeconomic equilibrium. So that's where you see fiscal uh, tax revenue. Okay. So this is the reform of social security. We already did the import, an important reform on social security. Everyone is saying, no, they, my government didn't do anything on social security, and they focus on increasing the retirement age, which is something that perhaps in a second reform will, will be done. But, but the point is that that's going to bring nothing in the short terms in revenue. That accumulates over a long period of time. Instead, we change the formula of adjustment for pensions, and that saves quite a lot of money if the economy grows. And I explain why. But let's first look at the figures. That's what will have happened with the previous formula that the government inherited. But, with the economy growing at any rate, doesn't matter what rate, it will have increased from 11 point of GDP to 12. Okay, but with the formula that we uh, pass in Congress, now if the economy grows, you reduce the expenditures of Social Security over GDP. Why? Before, before the, every pension was adjusted as a function of salaries and taxes. So thinking in a steady state growth, every, everything grows at the nominal GDP rate of growth. Hence, if pensions grow as the nomi at the nominal GDP, you cannot reduce the ratio of, of total expenditures in pension relative to nominal GDP. There's no way you can do it. So in most Normal countries, pensions growth only at the inflation rate of, of a mix of inflation and wages. So when the economy grows in real terms, you reduce the total expenditure. Then the total expenditure may increase by age and by other, other things. But that's not the problem right now in Argentina, because Argentina still for the next 10 years has what is called the a population bonus, right? That is still is not aging. It's going to start aging after 25. So, so, so then, let's not worry for 10 more years about that. Let's concentrate in the new formula, because now the new formula is two-thirds adjusted by inflation and one-third adjusted by wages. It means that two-thirds of real growth is used to reduce the burden of social security. And that's the most important pension reform that Argentina have to do, and it's done already. The problem was that the economy entered a recession again this year, and it's not growing. But once it recovers growth, it's going to show that uh, this adjustment is already uh, legislated, and that's, that's really important. So see there, it has the potential from, from now to 2023. 20, 20, to reduce public expenditures in two points of GDP. That's a lot. Just by something that the government already passed. It doesn't have to be done, OK? Right, so as you know now, let me, let me move to what happened, or my interpretation of what happened in the, in the of course, uh, the, 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 the whole 
situation for the Macri administration was one of extreme financial fragility. Because if you have a very large fiscal deficit and a very large current account deficit, and it couldn't be otherwise, because the government started with a current account deficit of three points of GDP. And the only way everything could be solved is by growing. If you, st if you have a fiscal deficit of eight points of GDP and the economy doesn't grow, you're not going to solve anything. The idea that in a non-growing economy you can reduce a fiscal deficit of eight points, I never seen that anywhere in the world ever. Okay? So yeah, in a radio program, an economist can say that can be done, but that's just cheap talk. Uh, so 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 the situation was that you take these eight points of deficit. And, and the previous government in the last year printed money by five points of GDP. Remember, it has 30% inflation, but five points of GDP is 50% of monetary base. So normally you have to have 50% inflation with that, with that level of printing. It didn't happen because of, finan of re financial repression and because all the prices of utilities were not increased, right? So the exchange rate was used to reduce inflation, the price of utility, but that was not sustainable. So the truth is that Macri inherited 50% inflation, which was the inflation that the Kirchner had in 2014. That was re the real uh, in, um, inflation that was received by the, and, and, and so, the government decided to go on a gradual path of reducing inflation, but in a sense it was a bit optimistic on how fast it can be done, given that, on the other hand, it has eight points of, of deficit that has to f be financed abroad if the government wanted to stop printing money to reduce inflation, because Argentina doesn't have domestic savings. The, the, the way we see it doesn't have domestic savings to finance the government, it's that it was already running a current account deficit. And the current account, as everyone knows, or at least the economists know, and for, for those that are not, I tell you, is exactly the external savings that the country use to complement the lack of savings the country have, okay? And, and that was a three point of deficit at a very low level of investment. So if it's going to grow, it's going to need more savings from abroad, so, so this, it, it, by, by definition it was in a very fragile situation. So now the people say, well, then if capitals revert, you, you will have had this crisis. Yeah, sure, but that was an, not an event that had to happen with probability one. It could have not happened. And in, in any event, if it happens, it happens. And, and of course, people, welfare is affected, and I'm aware of that, but that's reality. The, the government cannot escape that reality. And, and that's because, essentially, this is what, what is happening right now in Argentina. This is the key to understand what happened this year. So what happened is that there was a super commodity boom in Latino America between 2007 and 2011, 2012. And when the f prices of those commodities went down, what the country has to do? If it has a floating exchange rate, well, the markets will do it, the exchange rate will depreciate. If it has a fixed exchange rate, the government has to devaluate. What the government did in 2012, instead of devaluating, it just put a, an official market where it constrained access for financial necessities. It, on, it was only due to exports or importers. Okay, so it was called a CEPO in Argentina. I don't know why, but anyway, it was basically a dual exchange market, one free for savings. And so you see what happened. The, the one for savings really increased, but the other appreciated. And the appreciation was huge. Okay? So when Macri took over, in paper, he abandoned this um, dual exchange market and unified the markets and had a, a devaluation. But because capital, there was so much optimism for the country that there was 
huge inflows of capitals, and hence the real exchange rate didn't correct much. It corrects the nominal, but not the real. And, and that's because government cannot do much with capitals flowing. So once capitals reverted, and this is what's happening right now, capitals reverted, so we are completing the exit from this ex huge exchange rate appreciation. So we are going to a, an exchange rate that now is competitive, and that was not done entirely in 2016 because of the optimism with the new administration. What happened really this, this year was, well, okay, but, but that doesn't mean, uh, correct the, the fact that we are much poor. And we are much poor because once that shock happened, right, the government, instead of allowing the exchange rate to become competitive in 2012, make it even less competitive. So export, exports and imports decrease 30 uh, billions. I mean, that's huge. It was, uh, let's say, 30% of the exports were decreased. And, and that's hard to recover also in the short run. So what happened to the, the economy in, in the last Kirchner administration? So export decreased, import decreased, and investment decreased. So how the economy managed to grow in the electoral years by increasing public expenditures, right? As I showed you before, that was the only thing that was growing in Argentina for four years. So what do you need to revert this? Well, you need that public expenditure now to stop increasing and you increase exports and investment. And that's exactly what started to happen in the Macri administration, so we reverted that. But, but, but if you think, it didn't have much time, because the, fir the first year was the, the year where many uh, of the constraints in the economy were removed, and, and that accelerated inflation, and every time you accelerate inflation, you have a recession, because real wages go down, and consumption is very high in Argentina, we're talking about basically a country of a saving rate of 14, 15, 16 percent in, in constant in constant term, 20 percent uh, at, at market prices, right? So, so it, it consumption is very high, so when you hit that in the short term, the economy contracts at least a couple of quarters, and that happened in 2016, but then, as, then we get to the other problem is that is where we started. Argentina is a very complex country, and you have here a government that wants to change, but you don't have necessarily the majority of the population wanting the same change, and certainly not the Peronists wanting that change. So every time the Argentina face an election, it's not whether we are going to, you know, be a bit more uh, redistributive or a bit more market friendly or less. It's mostly about whether we are a capitalist and a liberal democracy or not. And so uncertainty is extreme. And, and that uncertainty was present in the election, in the midterm elections, because the former President Kirchner ran. And if she would have been elected that year, of, of course, the support, or the, ma the high or, or whatever support, the reforms that Macri wants to enhance, will have been uh, halted. And, and this situation will happen again in 19. So if Macri gets reelected, then of course reforms will be boosted and hopefully in 1920 the government will be able to continue with the reform agenda that mostly was able to uh, enact in 2017 after winning midterm elections. All right, so I guess that's, uh, well, no, I, I think I want to say something more. Just to confirm that, that the crisis the, f the, the, the FX crisis that the country went through this year was not anticipated because now you, you, every time you hear an analysis on the, on the news, they say, oh, I said, well, of course, this will have to happen. You know, of course, uh, you, you're not extremely rich, so of course you didn't know it. But, but, but the thing is that this is what 
all analysts report to the central bank month by month in terms of what they expect of growth and inflation, right? And so if you go to April 18, and, and the run on emerging markets started on April 24, right? That, now that's, we all agree on that now. So on April 18, all analysts on average were expecting an inflation of 21% for this year and an inflation of 15% for next year. So no one was seeing a deteriorating situation. And they were expecting a growth of 25 this year coming from 3.1 only because of the draw, not because they were expecting any problem in the FX market, and they, they, they didn't adjust at all. And the proof of that is they didn't adjust at all the expected growth for 2019 because the draw was supposed not to be present. So no one was expecting anything other than the draw. Okay. What happened at the end was that the draw was much more severe. It took more than half a point. Actually, it took more than one point of GDP. It explained all the recession in the second quarter. And now it turns out that in the third quarter, the economy is going to grow, given the numbers of August. Basically, even with very bad numbers in September, the economy is going to grow. So technically, there's no recession. Um, so. The other shocks that the country suffered was a huge increase in the price of oil, which affected substantially uh, the country because it has this inflation target. So any shock that it was already tied coming from above the inflation target, and any shock moved away and put expectations that there was going to be uh, an increase in the interest rate to because that was the, 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 the way that the uh, inflation target works and that could affect uh, the, ex the exchange rate appreciation in a situation where the current account was highly, uh, has a expected deficit of 5%. That puts a lot of tension on the FX market and all of the sudden, boom, there's a reversal of capitals to all emerging markets. Where So you have an idea. So people say the following. Well, but we all know that the interest rate was going to increase. Yeah, but the interest rate increased in 2016. It increased in 2017. And that doesn't stop capital flowing to emerging markets. Indeed, in 2017, Capitals flow into emerging markets were 100 billion, and this year it's going to be 7 billion. So it's a complete reversal. And what's the news that changed that? Was the large fiscal deficit in the US. No one is, was expecting the US to have, with an economy growing as strong as it's growing, a fiscal deficit of five points next year. So it's, it's basically absorbing large, very large amounts of capital. Yeah, and with that, I, I, I finish. Okay. Thank you very much, Sebastian. Emilio. Thank you, Mike. Thanks, everybody, for coming. Uh, I haven't been in government and uh, don't intend to be in government, but I wish and I hope Argentina can escape the populist trap in which it has been immersed for many years. So I will try to be brief. And let's see if I can make this work. How does this? OK, let's see. Well, I was here at the beginning of 2017. And I decided to bring back a tale of Greek mythology which was the passage between the, 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 in the Strait of Messina, of when Odysseus was going back to Ithaca. And he was facing two, two monsters, Scylla and Charybdis. And when I was here, I said that the monsters in Argentina were, on one hand, for Macri, at the beginning of 2017, the failure to put the economy back on a sustainable growth path, and the other monster was political, was uh, losing the midterm election in October 2017. And he had to chart a course and to advance with structural reforms. So I decided to give you an update of my Greek mythology chart. Uh, uh, 
basically the economy was not put on a sustainable growth path, but Macri won the election. So it avoided one monster, but uh, moved perilously close to another. So where are we now? Well, we want to move from a stagflation scenario where we are to a scenario of prosperity and stability. And again, what we need to do is fiscal adjustment and structural reform. And the monster we have now is growing foreign debt and the possibility of a currency in a debt crisis. And, and the other monster, again, is political. In this case, is failure to be reelected in 2019. So that's where we are. Now, I don't want to be too technical now. There's, there was a movie with uh, Bill Murray many years ago. I don't know if you remember, Groundhog Day. I was reading the other day a book by V.S. Naipaul, a Trinidad-born uh, British writer who won the Nobel Prize winner. And he spent some time in Argentina in the early 70s. And I was reading some of the articles he wrote. And, and I took some quotes from that that you can, you can read here. Um, and he was saying back then, Argentina is in a state of crisis that no Argentine can fully explain. Everyone is disaffected. The peso has gone to hell. Inflation is running at a steady 25%. The banks are offering 24% interest. Uh, it is impossible to put together capital, salaries, prices, exchange rate. Everyone talks money. Every, everyone who can afford buys dollars. And soon, even the visitor is touched by the hysteria. Now, Naipaul was a very cynical and very, he had a very bleak view of the world and he certainly had a bleak view of Argentina. But the funny thing is that some of the things he, he was talking about 50 years ago are some of the things we're still talking about in Argentina. So um, what has changed since last uh, year when I was here? Well, I don't do projections. Uh, I'm, I'm, I have more of a a perspective of an historian. And so I use projections produced by other people. And these projections are the projections for GDP per capita in Argentina that the IMF puts out. And what you see in the top line is basically the projections that the IMF put out in the World Economic Outlook earlier this year, April 2018. And the blue line, the solid blue line, uh, are the projections for GDP per capita uh, that uh, the IMF put out when it agreed to lend the $57 billion to Argentina. And as you can see, and this starts in, in, um, in 111, and I use 2015 as, as, uh, as the year when uh, the base year for for GDP per capita. So it's not expressed in, 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 in currency, but in terms of uh, 100. 2015 is 100. And, and what you see here is that the, the IMF is saying now that in 2023, so two presidential terms after the last cycle of populism ended, Argentine, Argentina's GDP per capita would be roughly the same after eight years. So that's what the IMF is telling us today. Uh, and again, you know, as all, uh, as all of you know, the IMF tends to be optimistic uh, in, in their projections. So this is one, one graph that, that I wanted to bring to your attention, and this is how things have changed. I mean, there's a huge gap between expectations and reality, and we'll see whether these expectations prove to be uh, bleak or whether they turn uh, to be um, optimistic. Now, the other thing that has changed is I like to look at this uh, chart, which shows you the ranking that Argentina has in global GDP per capita, or the position that Argentina has in global GDP per capita ranking. So the, the graph goes from one all the way to 194, which is the number of countries that the IMF uh, uh, has statistics for. And this graph, again, compares the ranking of Argentina in 2023 based on the April projections earlier this year, so six or seven months before, and the ones we have now. And what we see in this chart, which is the, the thick red line, is that Argentina in 2023, according to the IMF, uh, is going to be much worse off. It will have fallen about 20 um, positions in global GDP per capita ranking. So in 2015, Argentina would have been 
uh, in position 52, and in 2023 it's going to be 76. Now, it's almost a, a joke to include uh, the position that Argentina had 70 years ago before we started on this populism uh, addiction. Uh, but, you know, from 1875 to 1945, on average, Argentina was the seventh most prosperous country in the world. So that shows you the gap between what could have been and, and, and what it is. Uh, then uh, let's look at inflation a little bit. What, what is the IMF telling us? Well, the, the red line, the dotted red line there, shows you what the IMF was telling us earlier this year. Um, the thick blue line is the latest um, projection by the IMF, which is a, a week old, let's say. And as you can see, we're going to be uh, hitting about more than 40% this year, actually, something like 44%. And again, when we do historical analysis and we compare uh, the numbers with, uh, with, the, with the populist uh, regime that uh, was um, in Argentina before, obviously there are many caveats. First of all, because the previous government basically distorted statistics, and also because there was repressed inflation, as uh, Sebastián Galliani pointed out. But still, uh, there is a huge gap between what people expected and what we're going to get. Um, and, and finally, I want to focus on another issue which is very important, which is competitiveness. Uh, in 2014-2015, the World Economic Forum gave Argentina a score of 3.8 uh, and ranked the country 104th among 144. Well, the last report came out last week and Argentina gets a score of 4.0 uh, and ranks 92 out of 137 countries. And in the report, this is what the World Economic Forum points out as the most serious issues that the Argentine economy faces going forward. As you see at the top, you have inflation, but right below inflation, you have tax rates, okay? Uh, policy instability, access to financing, restrictive, restrictive labor regulations. Well, if you went back four years ago, you would have seen pretty much the same list by the World Economic Forum. What I'm trying to say is if Argentina wants to escape this trap and do away with this Groundhog Day movie that we've seen over and over again, because we've seen this movie before, it seems like the the, uh, the situation repeats itself and there's no collective learning, uh, Argentina has to change, it has to do a serious structural reform. And the big question I have going forward is whether the government will be able to enact this structural reform, even if it wins the election in 2019, and right now it's, it's really a toss-up, it's unclear whether uh, Macri will be reelected or not. Uh, and the question is whether society, the Argentine society, will accept those structural reforms. Because structural reforms are costly. And, and according to a recent poll I was reading this morning when I, after I, I landed in D.C., there was a poll done recently that showed that 80% of the people who were polled in Argentina, 80% uh, thought that uh, reducing public spending was not the right way to go. Well, uh, in fact, public spending is the root of the problem. And in this chart, again, I use the statistics and the projections of the IMF. And I, in the red dotted line is the numbers we were thinking about back at the beginning of 2017. Uh, and the blue line is where we are right now. So you can see that according to the IMF, which today one would assume puts out the most well-informed projections about the Argentine economy because they've been working on these numbers together with the Argentine government, by the end of 2023, 20, uh, public spending will be about 36.2% of GDP, okay? after ballooning to almost 42% in 2018. So, well, how does that look? Well, let's look at the rest of the region, okay? 
And the numbers for the rest of the region can be summarized in this graph. The blue line is what the IMF projects for Argentina. Uh, the green line is what the, the average for eight Latin American countries that are relevant. Those are the neighbors of Argentina and the largest economies in Latin America. So we're including Bolivia, Chile, Colombia, uh, Mexico, Peru, Paraguay, and Uruguay. And the red line is what I uh, consider the most dynamic economist in Latin America, which are Chile, Colombia, Peru, and Mexico. And you can see that even after this big effort that uh, we were, um, that Sebastián Galliani was explaining to us before, even after that, according to the projections of the IMF, we're way above where the rest of the uh, countries in Latin America are on average. Only Bolivia and Brazil, two populist uh, countries, right now ha have a level of, GDP, uh, of uh, government spending to GDP comparable to Argentina. And in my view, this is essentially the root of the problem. And if we cannot change this, we're not going to be able to escape from this Groundhog Day trap. Because at the end of the day, the fundamental problem that Argentina has is it is a country that has been accustomed to consume more than it produces. There are a lot of people who want to live beyond their means, and the people who want to work to produce are hampered by taxes, by regulations, and also by the efforts of the non-working types who basically blockade the streets and, 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 and create chaos in the city every day. So that is the, the fundamental problem. And, and public spending in Argentina is basically redistribution of income. And when we hear that, well, it turns out that two-thirds of public spending is social security, yes, well, that's part of the problem. Because right now in Argentina, what we have is about 20 million people who every month collect a check from the government. And these 20 million include pensioners, include four uh, 0.2 million public employees at all levels. And remember, Argentina has a population of about 42 million people. So we have about 10% of the population employed by government. These are really low productivity uh, uh, jobs. And then we have people who receive uh, some sort of subsidy from the government. So we have 20 million people who receive uh, money from the, the public treasury. And we have only 8 million who actually work in the formal sector and contribute with income taxes and payroll taxes to support the government. And then we have about six million who work in the informal sector and therefore do not pay taxes. So the ratio of people who work to the people who do not work or who work in very unproductive uh, jobs is very, uh, very large, okay? So that, that is uh, something that we need to change. And if Argentina is not willing to change and then we go into politics, then we're not going to get out of, of, this, of this trap. So that's pretty much uh, what I wanted to say. And, and to add simply that not only in 2023 uh, we're going to be pretty much roughly at the same level in terms of GDP per capita as in 2015, but we have indebted the country by almost $150 billion in the last three and a half years. So Argentina today has a lower GDP and has a lot more debt. And the, the, the big challenge for the government, and to avoid those monsters, because we all want Argentina to be prosperous and, and stable, there's a big challenge ahead. And the question is whether the government will have the willingness to tackle this fundamental problem, and whether society will have the patience and the tolerance to go ahead with it. Um, that's pretty much what I uh, had to say today. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Emilio. Good morning, everybody. Um, I'm the third one to speak, and I'm very glad because my friends and colleagues um, have made my job easier, uh, despite the difficulties of the topic. Um, I would like, I'm not going to use transparencies, I'm going to just um, uh, 
talk a few minutes about first the main challenges, which um, I fully agree with both Sebastian and uh, Emilio. I mean, I would say that um, the main challenge uh, has to do with reaching and maintaining macroeconomic stability in, Ar in Argentina. Um, the second um, is to, I would argue that is to improve uh, competitiveness. Um, you know, Emilio showed us a, a graph on competitiveness. This is something that uh, keeps being updated by the World, uh, the World Economic Forum, but I think it's at the root of, of the structural uh, reforms that are needed uh, in the country um, in order to be able to leverage a, a good uh, amount of innovation that is happening in Argentina um, uh, into uh, um, affecting in a positive way economic growth and, and therefore development. And the third one, which I think that um, um, I gathered and you did too from the initial presentations, is the need to promote cultural change. And I think that, um, you know, among those three main challenges, um, if we all Argentines, both uh, the ones living in the country and, and all of us living abroad, but uh, trying to um, contribute uh, to solving uh, the problems of the country, uh, we can focus on, on this cultural change, then a, a good number of the answers uh, will be found. Now, uh, without losing perspective, um, I think that um, uh, it's important to uh, take stock of what uh, has already been made, and, and this is uh, something that uh, most of the time in Argentina, people tend to overlook. I mean, it's very difficult uh, to focus on the positive side of things when uh, the environment is, is rather uh, difficult and getting uh, more difficult. Uh, but at the same time, we all know as human beings that um, it's, not, uh, it's not good to only focus on the negative and it's important to uh, balance things out. So I would like to do that if you allow me in a few minutes. Um, Argentina uh, is certainly more active um, in international fora and this is not something uh, that um, has gone unnoticed. Uh, in, in fact, uh, Argentina holds the presidency of the G20 this year and uh, will host uh, uh, world leaders uh, at the end of next month. Um, and this is not just um, a, you know, a social uh, type of, of gathering or, or um, effectiveness in, in organizational skills when it comes to uh, inviting the countries of, uh, of, uh, around the globe to, to focus on the G20 agenda. It's, um, I would argue that, um, uh, in a way, this um, has uh, brought about an externality to the country in order to um, um, help to, for people to be more aware ab about what is the world agenda in terms of, of the main topics and, uh, and certainly at a time um, when uh, multi, multi, uh, multilateral um, uh, institutions are um, under review or, or not necessarily um, uh, fully supported uh, by um, a few of, of the G7 countries, uh, Argentina uh, certainly believes in, in multilateralism um, and, um, and therefore exercises um, this belief. Um, with respect to the, the very necessary structural reforms, um, I would argue that uh, the Macri administration has, uh, from the outset, um, chose to follow some of the best practices of, uh, from OECD. Um, in, in that context, um, the country has uh, um, applied for membership, and I would also argue that what is, uh, for me, uh, most relevant is not membership per se, 
but it's the process um, to um, frame structural reforms uh, using as a basis uh, the type of, of, um, of framework of best practices that OECD um, countries have um, already uh, established uh, in a very clear way and in a very comprehensive way. So uh, the Argentine government um, is committed uh, to this effort. Um, from the standpoint of some of the uh, of, of others, other uh, reforms that are underway, um, infrastructure investment, which is very necessary in the country, as, as it, it was already been mentioned earlier, um, is underway. Um, uh, one could also argue that uh, it's been modest so far because obviously uh, the budget constraint is such that uh, a public investment hasn't um, increased as, as much as it would have been needed. And uh, private uh, sector funded investment um, is coming slowly through uh, a recently approved uh, a PPP regime um, that uh, was approved in, by Congress and uh, some of those schemes have started being uh, implemented. The, rede the redefinition of the energy matrix is something that um, has also uh, started uh, being uh, not only promoted but executed and um, we heard about some of the issues re regarding uh, the subsidy structure uh, but um, I would also argue that there has been a, a, a very clear effort from the part of, of the government to um, redefine the core elements of that matrix and uh, to uh, promote investments um, in, in the sector in order to achieve that objective. From the standpoint of other aspects um, regarding to um, public security, I mean, uh, this is something that uh, the country also inherited from the previous administrations um, with uh, borders that had not been uh, well protected, with security forces that um, had not been uh, professional enough. Um, and that is changing in Argentina. Um, simplification of processes, going back to the uh, comment on, on doing business, um, is uh, taking hold um, in a number of, of different um, activities, uh, but primarily uh, focused on uh, reducing um, uh, the number of, of layers and the number of stops for a, a, any a particular um, administrative um, process. Um, the, there has also been a quite a bit of progress in terms of um, uh, adoption of uh, some of the best practices in, in ICT, um, that is information communications and technology. Um, in particular, I would argue that uh, through the modernization of systems and, and paperless government, this is something that is taking hold in Argentina that um, we haven't seen to the, to the whole extent yet, but um, I think that um, it's something that it's, it's certainly being worked on and uh, will be coming up. From the standpoint of, of um, adoption of policies on transparency, integrity, anti-corruption. This is something that uh, where we started seeing um, some slow progress and all of a sudden there was a major disruption with some of the um, uh, corruption charges uh, being um, uh, now on the table and, and driven by the judiciary um, uh, branch of, of the, uh, the judiciary branch. Um, the, uh, we have seen so far the beginning, and I would argue uh, that this is only the beginning. Um, with respect to some uh, concrete um, measures um, uh, taken by the government on cost cutting in government procurement across sectors, um, this is uh, already for real. And across the board, I would also argue that um, there has been a clear determination to promote competition or more competition. Everything is relative, after all. 
um, and consumer protection policies. So this covers um, a wide uh, array of areas where uh, action uh, is already underway. Now, um, what is the pending agenda? And uh, you know, this is something that uh, it, it will sound daunting, like a daunting task, uh, but um, I think that uh, um, there is a window of opportunity. Why there is a window of opportunity? Well, because some of the, um, the initial adjustment has, it has been made because uh, there will be um, elections, presidential elections next year, um, and the world uh, in a way is, um, has already uh, shown that um, supports at least the intentions uh, of Argentina this time around. Um, from the standpoint of that pending agenda, um, undoubtedly um, the, the need to reach and to maintain, as I said uh, initially, um, macroeconomic stability um, is uh, critical and uh, an, an absolute uh, necessary condition. Now, um, I think that um, the need to define the strategic positioning of Argentina in Latin America um, is also a, a pending uh, agenda. We could argue that um, the Macri administration has uh, clearly uh, been um, uh, holding a, a position of leadership when it comes to the Venezuelas of this world um, and uh, some other issues related to the continent. However, I think that there is still some hesitation about whether to get closer to that um, block of countries that Emilio was pointing out, the Pacific Alliance, uh, which are a group of countries that uh, have shown both stability and a, a determination to uh, pursue a, a particular course of reform over the years, so that is in a sustained way. And then when one plots uh, this grouping of countries, the Pacific Alliance, and then Brazil, on the other hand, uh, which is the, the main uh, trading partner of Argentina and has been for, for a number of years, then once one uh, can tell that there is a clear um, a gap in terms of uh, the, the, the behavior of these countries. And Argentina has not yet, in my view, um, adopted a clear uh, determination from the standpoint of uh, how to uh, define um, these uh, trading and or um, affiliations when it comes to issues, for example, related to capital markets. So um, that, that is a, a, pending, a pending decision. Um, the need to, uh, to continue diversifying um, and opening up the economy I think it's uh, pretty clear, and uh, my colleagues have, have already pointed out um, this, but I think that it's when one looks at, at, at the, the extent of the, the closeness of uh, the Argentine economy, it's, it's quite staggering, and this has to change. Um, in terms of deepening other structural reforms, um, you know, if going back to the challenge of improving competitiveness, the labor market um, is far from um, allowing right now uh, this uh, reaching a, a, a reasonable level of com competitiveness. So the government has put forward um, a labor market reform, uh, but that has not yet um, made it through Congress. Um, there are issues related to the regulatory framework across the board, issues related to education, health, and so on. I mean, so that's why I, I, I said that it may sound daunting, uh, because uh, it is a quite a, quite, it has a quite a steep slope. Um, but at, as we all know, and, and as we've learned, um, it's really no longer possible to rely only on efficiency gains or cost-cutting uh, um, behavior or decisions uh, in order to achieve economic success. So the, the type of um, 
reliance of, on innovation uh, and the flexibility and, and, and adaptation of economies to changes is as important. And there, Argentina has a number of assets, but it also has the liabilities that I just uh, tried to uh, share with you regarding some of the, um, both the regulatory, and in part taxation, in part just pure regulatory uh, frameworks, and, um, and in part, uh, or, and to a large extent, the rigidity in the labor market. Um, the need to increase savings in order for those savings to be channeled to investment is um, very relevant for Argentina, for the Argentina that we want to see ahead. That was also mentioned and I fully share that. Um, and I would add that um, it's necessary to deepen the level of financial intermediation. Uh, this uh, financial intermediation in the country has been very, very shallow. It has been primarily um, concentrated on banking intermediation and not, not the non-banking, which pretty much, um, as we know and as we learn also in, in more developed countries, is, is uh, very necessary. Um, and uh, this has to happen in Argentina. The need to strengthen institutions, and these, you know, institutions these days uh, have, they have even more and more elements into them. I mean, we can go from uh, talking about just the, the particular structures of government to the particular way in which uh, private sector uh, make, the private sector makes decisions. I mean, uh, in, in, I'm, I'm referring to corporate governance standards. I'm referring to uh, some of the property rights issues, and uh, I'm referring to some of the security issues that I mentioned earlier. So institutions, it's a very broad concept, but Argentina pretty much needs to strengthen and, and make an effort on most of them in order to succeed. Um, let me finish uh, with a reference to the main risks ahead. Um, on, on these ones, I would argue that in the short term, they are pretty high um, and they tend to be lower in the medium term. Why? And in what type of risks I'm referring to? Um, I came to think of, of four main type, types of risks that the country faces um, at this point. Um, the first one uh, is what we would call geopolitical and geoeconomic risks. And um, in there, we can um, highlight um, the, the impact that, that uh, the uh, recent increase in trade policy tensions um, are having and, and, and will continue having in, in Argentina. Um, for some of these types of adjustments that need to take place. Um, Brazil's um, level of stability and economic growth, well, remains to be seen. We have a, a, the result of yesterday's election, uh, but there is a, a lot still um, a, to be understood about what lies ahead for Brazil and Argentina uh, is quite uh, dependent on uh, the behavior of the Brazilian economy. Um, in there, I would, uh, I would uh, bring about again the issue of the Pacific Alliance countries uh, that do provide opportunities for, for Argentina. Um, and I would also add uh, into the, the uh, geoeconomic risks um, the expansion, the recent expansion of uh, illicit financing that has been happening uh, in the region um, and in particular in Argentina. Um, therefore, um, uh, those are the, 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 the main risks that I would mention in that category. Moving on to um, institutional and political risks, um, I would say that uh, the, um, the need to have uh, the focus of the, of the current government and, and eventually a continuity in an election year are, are key in order to expect uh, a reasonable probability of success. Um, I, I, would, I would think that uh, from what we um, understand, 
uh, about the different political forces. Um, there are some. Co uh, there is some common ground even uh, in in the opposition, or at least in part of the opposition, about the need to undertake some of these reforms that I was re referring to. But um, I would also argue that uh, it's not as broadly. Um, uh, share this reform agenda as um, I would like to see. The, um, the impact of the slowing down of the economy um, on social tension uh, is clearly uh, one risk that it shouldn't be underestimated. Um, the uh, sort of byproduct of some of the recent initiatives uh, that I mentioned on integrity, transparency, and anti-corruption um, present some institutional risks to Argentina because um, uh, these are long processes, but uh, so far um, the level of corruption that um, has uh, come uh, clear uh, on, uh, on, onto the table, it's something that uh, not only affects uh, uh, the public sector, sort of previous governments, uh, but, uh, but also some players in the private sector. And, um, and the last uh, element to this the category of risk that I would mention is, uh, is related to some of the immigration issues. Argentina is, is, uh, is a host country when it comes to um, immigrants. Um, and this provides some challenges, but also opportunities. So that's why I, I, I would like to include it in, in that category of risks. In terms of the third, uh, finan uh, sorry, in terms of the third type of risk, the financial risks, um, the sudden stop has already happened, um, as, as Sebastian was mentioning, uh, and the question is, um, for how long this, uh, this would continue, and therefore what happens right after that. And the, there is a, a whole um, set of, of uh, uh, elements in the literature regarding sudden stops, but um, uh, in the case of Argentina, some of the other elements that we've been trying to share with you also play a role, and that's, that's where uh, the questions uh, lie. Some of the, the possible deteri deterioration um, of lending portfolios of the banks uh, due to the decline in economic activity uh, remains to be seen. And um, some of the implica implications of what Emilio told us about um, increasing levels of borrowing um, should also be analyzed, um, I think, in this category. And at last but not least, um, the structural risks that Argentina faces, um, in a way, um, I think that could be somewhat facilitated by, in a way, um, uh, importing the type of, of uh, benchmarks and, and frameworks um, that uh, o accession uh, to OECD and the, the process of accession to OECD could provide as an instrument to mitigate those risks. Um, this is something that clearly um, uh, becomes quite relevant um, in the months and years ahead in order to make sure that some of the um, key pieces of legislation um, are um, discussed and hopefully approved in, in Congress, and if not, uh, to work on, on the regulatory uh, frameworks uh, that um, uh, would require uh, quite a bit of, of focus and, and commitment uh, from both uh, the government and the private sector. So with that, I thank you. Thank you very much. Well, I don't know about all of you, but I'm left kind of breathless. Um, those were three um, very different presentations, um, reflecting what I think is an incredibly complex um, situation that Argentina has presented for many decades. Um, as someone who lived in Argentina for 12 years, I've experienced this myself. and. Um, it, truly, um, the level of, of complexity is, is, is remarkable. Um, for me, the, the issue of uh, cultural change is, is 
probably one of the most important um, issues that, that President Makati has addressed, the need for a cultural change to overcome um, the legacy that Argentina has, uh, has lived um, over the last hundred years. Um, a country that was uh, in the top 10 uh, economies of the world at the beginning of the, of the 19th century, or uh, the 20th century, and, and is now somewhere in the, the, the high 60s, low 70s. Um, one issue, I, I think there's a very simple understanding in this country of, of what those complexities are. I think uh, a lot of people uh, watched in, in horror over the, the years of, of the Kirchners. Um, seeing a regime that, that looked like a regime um, similar to, to Venezuela. And with the election of Mauricio Macri in, in 2015, most people figured that that was all going to be put behind. Uh, and there was a, a very simple uh, assumption that it, it was going to be easy to put that inheritance, that legacy behind. Um, it, it isn't. It hasn't been easy. It's not going to be easy. And I think the next uh, decade or two are going to be very difficult in Argentina, but um, I, I see what's going on now in Argentina. As someone here mentioned a window of opportunity. I think that the country does, uh, it does have a window of opportunity at this point. Um, I believe that, that the Makati government recognizes that and is truly, uh, <coughs> truly um, trying to, to address that. Um, trying to bring about this cultural change, um, recognizing the difficulties, um, but also recognizing that, that this is not going to be a simple, a simple um, there is no silver bullet. This is not going to be a process um, you know, from, from one day to the next or one year to the next. Um, despite all of these difficulties, I, I see in Argentina today um, at least a small majority of people who understand these complexities and understand that a cultural change is needed. And having spent uh, 10 days in Argentina just a couple of weeks ago, um, I, I'm convinced that, that uh, this small majority is still likely to give President Makati um, another four years. The kinds of changes that he's tried to bring about in these first four years were never going to be achieved or achieved fully in four years. And I think most people recognize that the last thing that Argentina needs at this point is to, to go back, to go back to the populist past um, that has been uh, the root of all of its problems over, over the last 50, 60 years. Um, but truly, uh, I, I, am left, I am left breathless by the, the complexities of the, of the reforms that, that are still needed. Um, it's remarkable what has been achieved in these uh, three years. Um, and I am still hopeful that, uh, that Makri, over the next year, is going to be able to consolidate uh, some of what he's been trying to do. And I hope that uh, with four more years, um, this cultural change will be um, will be consolidated in Argentina in a way that hopefully will allow uh, Argentina to escape, uh, to escape the legacy, its legacy of the past. Um, we've taken a lot of time, more time than we expected. I'd like to give the audience a little bit of time uh, to, to ask a few questions. Um, I'd also welcome any response from our three panelists to uh, each, other's, um, each other's presentations. Um, I know the presentations were very different, the perspectives very different. Um, I'm a, a glass is half full kind of guy. I've had this conversation with, with uh, Emilio for many years. Um, I still believe that the glass is half full in Argentina and that um, over the next months and years, uh, the country is going to emerge from what is this uh, very complex situation. Sebastian. Yeah, no, I like i like to reflect a bit on, on the three presentations in this, in this way. So what Emilio has shown is, is, is something I agree, and, and I imagine the three of us agree. So we, we see populism as the problem of Argentina. The, the big discussion is how do you move out of that, right? Uh, and, and so some people say, well, structural reform. Yeah, let's put content into that specifically. But let's remind that Macri won on a ballotage by a small margin of three points. He doesn't control any of the two chambers. He only, the coalition that uh, goes with Macri, Cambiemos, only controls five states out of 24. So it's not 
that he can pass all the reforms. Uh, it's, there's no free lunch out there, okay? So the, the, that's one thing. But the second thing is the recent history of Argentina. Argentina had had attempts to uh, structural reform that were reverted, right? So you have to, if you are rational, you have to think of a plan, at least to tell me what are the risks that are involved in the different path to reforms, right? And, and no one really knows what is cultural change in the sense that how a government really managed to produce cultural change. So to me, the only shot that the country has, and that's why I work with the idea that there is progressive reform and success, and people get to adapt to that, and they say, well, we are doing well, we are doing well, and we keep doing this. But that takes 20 years. It never takes two or three years. It's, it's not going to take that. But there is hope. Chile elected a socialist government in 73. And now it's a prosperous country. Israel was completely socialist up to 85. And now it's extremely prosperous. Israel has a public expenditure of 80% of GDP in 85. Now it's 40. He didn't, didn't do it in a year or two. It took 20 years to reform the Israeli economy. But it was done. And Argentina has to do it. And the reason now I'm optimistic is because I, as an academic, I study populism, but I not study like with, with ideology in the sense that I don't like it. And it, no, no, I study why it was an equilibrium in Argentina and why is now less of an equilibrium since the, most people work in the service sector? And that is true since the early 90s. I guess that the Kirchners were a, a, a mistake of the history of the country. And it happens because the, the political party that represents the middle classes collapsed in the crisis of 2002. And so they, lo they didn't have any representations. And now what Macri came to offer again is that representation. And if you look at the last three elections, what you see is that the middle classes have win in all provincial capitals by four or five. The Peronists are not winning the provincial capitals. And it's very hard to become the majority if you don't win in the, pro in the capitals. One thing. And the second thing is the Peronists don't have re renovation. They don't have new talent, professional people to seduce those middle classes. They, all of them are with Cambiemos. And all of them are with President Macri. So I think, of course, things are com complex. And, and, and if the economy doesn't do well, well, there's a problem. And we may get back to populism. But if things go well, there's going to be a, a, a gradual process of improvement. And people is going to start to change their, their beliefs based on that. The contrary idea of going and tell 8, 10 million people Say, look, you have to understand, you don't need this check. You need to go and find a shop tomorrow. It's not going to work, right? That's not going to work. I mean, of, of, it will be great if it works, because then you can produce change in a year. But I don't think that is what works. Not realistic, that's for sure. Um, questions from the audience? And if, if no questions at this point, um, Emilio, Silvina, any last thoughts, any last? Uh... Well, uh, one last uh, thought uh, in order to uh, try to respond to, to Sebastian. Uh, on the issue of structural reforms, um, I think that the, the key is to identify the few that the government feels that can really uh, carry, carry out. And, and do it and, and, and keep continuity. And, and that's why I wanted to, uh, to share some thoughts on you know, competitiveness, because I think that that's, that's an area that in Argentina is, uh, has, been, has been an issue for a long time. I mean, we, we do have, as we like to call, buckets of more competitive. Some of, some of them are in services, some of them are in the, in the in, in, the, in the production of, of some other goods and, 
but um, uh, what, what uh, is missing and where I would put the effort is in identifying a few of those areas. I mean, being, you know, labor, I think it's, it's absolutely critical because it's at the core of that cultural change. And, you know, I think that the three of us uh, agree on that because, you know, otherwise, um, you know, if somebody uh, that is not working uh, gets, gets a subsidy and uh, then the incentives are not there, and even the ones who work, I mean, uh, uh, who are um, part of, of that labor force is, is managed uh, and led in some cases by unions um, you know, which are unions that go back to, you know, several decades ago in terms of the way they see um, the, the, the way to produce and to, to deliver services to the consumers, that, that there, there is something there that has to change. And I think that it's, uh, and some of those unions are also uh, part of those buckets of corruption, and therefore, you know, everything seems to be, um, uh, you know, they are out to, to, to have to be dealt with, and Argentina has to deal with that. And it has to, to deal with some other issues related to capital markets, for example. I mean, this is something that, you know, uh, the private sector uh, and the government cannot really uh, expect to uh, reach a certain level of investment if uh, capital markets are, are not uh, deeper in the country, and, and so I mean, there are a, a few priorities that I think are pretty clear, and um, and I think that the government has started, as I tried to, to share with with you all, um, but more needs to be done, and and has to be done in a systematic way. Emilio, I'm yeah, leave just the last word with yeah, you. Thank you. Last but not least, uh, no. Going back to what you mentioned about cultural change, I mean, if we expect cultural change from the government, we're in deep trouble. Mao launched his cultural revolution, uh, killed a bunch of people, and after he died, China turned into capitalism, his arch enemy. So, you know, to expect that the government can change culture is, in my view, a very, you know, unrealistic uh, assumption. At most, what you can do is nudge people in certain directions, putting in place uh, s different rules of the game, etc. So, the second thing I would say is, uh, at least in my case, I don't think Argentina can be solved with a silver bullet, or it can be solved with a presidential mandate. And I agree that it would probably take one generation, which us usually sociologists measure as 25 years. It would take one generation for Argentina to prove to itself and to the rest of the world that it managed to escape this Groundhog Day that we lived you know, for the last 70 years, which is cycles of populism uh, that are completely unrealistic and throw the economy into a crisis followed by periods of adjustment that politically are not sustainable. So uh, it's a big challenge, and I think there are grounds to be optimistic on certain sides, and there are some other signs that are not very encouraging. In my view, the not encouraging aspect of what happened in the last three years is that the government was very unrealistic about what it could achieve without pushing for reforms, and now it finds itself very surprised at what has happened. And so I think we need to take a more realistic approach, because if we didn't have the chambers before, well, we don't have them now, but we still have to do and now we have the IMF telling us, okay, you need to get to zero deficit uh, to get out of this mess, and we're going to lend you money, but only if you do this. So it's a complex problem of our own creation, because that's the bottom line. You know, Argentines are responsible for, for uh, what we have. And uh, hopefully we can manage to get political leaders who are very realistic and understand what is the real problem of, of the Argentine economy and, and that can communicate to society and they can communicate to the electorate and the electorate buys into this idea of reform because you know you can you can devise any plan you want uh, with a group of academics but you, you at the end of the day we live in a democracy and you need to get the support of the electorate so that that's that's what I would say to I'd like to thank all three of you. Uh, very, very good presentations. Um, 
We, um, we haven't hidden the fact that uh, we're dealing with a, a very complex country, complex situation, but uh, I hope that we've helped to clarify some of those complexities for you here today. But uh, thank you all very much. Thank you.